literally do that, say it, and then we get it wrong. Yeah. Every fucking, like the last, how many times? Pretty much. We're going now. Yeah. You can take it off, it's fine. People know by now that it's the most unprofessional podcast. Take it away, James. Well, we're back. Another episode. Make it Mastermind podcast. This week we have Rosie Rascal. Got it right. You can't get the rascal wrong. No, we can't get it wrong. So, if people don't know you, don't know much about you, don't give yourself a little bit of intro. intro, Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so I'm originally from over near the Lake District, so I'm like a little country village girl originally, Um, and I... uh, really growing up it was all about sort of dance singing acting that was my life um and then moved over to Leeds in hmm, about 15 years ago I can't remember the date so I'll just say time wise moved over to Leeds about 15 years ago and that was when I started my pursuit into bodybuilding um so (laughs) my whole life it was like dreaming about being dancer singer actress and all that kind of thing and then um the last year of my degree which i was doing contemporary dance um the teacher said you need to build a little bit of strength for your dancing um and i met my ex-husband that was into bodybuilding he taught me how to train eat and everything and by the end the last year of my degree i'd completely packed in all of my performance and i was like okay, I'm going to be a bodybuilder. Wow. Um, and from then, I just pretty much decided I was going to, I really wanted to be a professional. I wanted to get my IFBB Pro card, um, which was crazy because I was not like a bodybuilder. You can see me like in flesh. I'm so small, aren't I? Um, and I was like less than six stone. So it was like a crazy little pursuit wow. that I set out on. Um, I knew I wanted to get my pro card. I knew I wanted to go to the Olympia. And then I just set out on this like 15 year, um, absolutely relentless mission to go do it. So um, I guess that that was one of the, the, the biggest sort of decisions of my life that's kind of led me to where I am and who I am today, really. Just going through the... The, the crazy lifestyle of being a professional bodybuilder. Yeah, like, I mean, we've had a few bodybuilders on and they've talked to us about prep and it uh-huh. sounds absolutely crazy and we will get into that. Yeah. So let's take things up to the start then, I guess, sort yeah. of your early childhood. Were you an active kid? You must have been by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah. So like when you grow up, I guess, and before all social media and everything, when you grow up in like a little village, it's all about playing. Mm-hmm. It's like going out, playing. Um, you know, you would leave the house and not come back till night and you were just always out and about i did um lots of different types of dancing um so i've always been someone that and even just naturally i'm someone that's always moving it's like i'm just hyper it's like i'm on speed all the time when people watch me it's like i'm ready ready (laughs) to go always so Mm. yeah that's it so when you're saying you're into dance into acting yes singing how did, what was it, because I, I understand it about that, you look at people on the TV, singers, all that stuff, it's, you know, it's something, it's cool, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But bodybuilding, especially for women, is like not as, it's not a, a path that many people take. Mm. What caught your eye? What inspired you? What was like, oh, that's fucking cool. Like, what, like, mm. what was it that, that, that drove you down that path in the end? What, to make that switch? It definitely wasn't like an aesthetic thing. And the whole bodybuilding pursuit for me was never like, okay, I want to look like this and that's why I'm going to do this. Um, I guess for me it was, um, I like being good at stuff. Like most people, you kind of want to do things that you're good at. And the minute I started it, I was just really good at it. I guess because of having a background in, in dancing, you you you're kind of an athlete already. So it was just like transferring some of those strengths and into another sport. Um, So I was really strong when I started for my size. And it was just, I think a lot of the bodybuilding thing for me was like attention and ego um, when I first got into it because it was like feeling special and unique and and just, um, yeah, just getting that, that attention from everybody like in the gym like whoa she's like so strong and mm. um and also I, like for the first time in my life I felt really really competitive 
and even like in dance I've, there was an element of it but I think there was um, a little bit of self doubt a lot of the time in thing in dance and so on but with bodybuilding it was just like this it was just like something like ignited in me and it was fierce and I just fucking loved it I just f like felt like on fire for the first time in my life so yeah it's, it's addictive yeah it's addictive in what what part of it what part of it is addictive what what was the was it the stepping on stage knowing that you put in all that work and you were you know even you know in better shape and all oh. these other girls or being that person in the gym do you know being that like gym rat there's always that oh. that wooden beast in the gym though it's like there's always like someone who's like fucking oh, i don't even know mr why he walks in mm. but i know him from sight because he's a beast yeah do you know what what was it i loved the trick like the training i just loved training hard and seeing how far i could push myself and it was like me and my ex-husband for the whole whole 10 years it was just me and him and it was like this amazing little partnership and journey it was like it it was really intense and that that was a lot of it i think that kind of um teamwork you know it was really exciting um but i think you know if you look at things like on a deeper level i think through through my life I always felt quite repressed, um, like I had to do things in a certain way. And I guess for me, bodybuilding was almost like a, a you know, a rebellious side of me. Um, and there was a big, big part of me that was, I think for me, I quite like doing things that are the opposite of what someone would do because it's like, especially when I was younger, not so much now, but it was like wanting to prove mm prove to people i don't know fucking who but it was like yeah i'll show you it's like who <laughs> but it was like that that drive and when i when i was competing i didn't really um visualize and think about so much the the euphoric moments on stage and winning and getting the trophy i was very much a, an away from person so i was um doing it through fear of failure so I had to, I got my excitement and drive and sort of passion from making sure that I wasn't a failure. So it was like a real weird upside down way of doing things, but it worked for me yeah. to, to become a champion, you know. Mm. So with, with bodybuilding, and it obviously takes a lot of discipline, a strong mindset. Um, is that something you've always had or is that something that you've built and kind of developed over there? Your, your, your lifetime so far um i think i don't think i really did have that when when i was younger because i've always been quite a creative sort of dreamy type of person like i'd be the type of person that bedroom was an absolute tip like growing up and just a little bit flaky and i think you know bodybuilding it's like when you have a real passion for something it's like so when I finished bodybuilding, I went into a business course. I did a business course. And all the things that I learned on this business course, I was like, shit, I was doing that as a bodybuilder, but I didn't know. So I was like following this template of how to become a champion, how to be a success, how to be the best at something. And I had no clue that I was doing any of it. So it was like, um, you know, things like, uh, doing a timeline so you would like set your big goal and then um, reverse engineer it mm. so I was doing all those things and then tracking everything um, re repetition you know so mm. so all those things it, it, I don't know it just kind of fell into place for me where I guess it was just like when you have that true passion it's like you just end up following that path mm. yeah do you know what I think it's it's actually it's, it's really nice to hear because people look at bodybuilding and think how can anyone normal joe walking around the street relate to it mm. but when you break it down it's like keeps you accountable yeah every day like small steps small goals small yeah. progress like yeah. i'd like one one plate to your squat add this to that yeah cut this many carbs like all these little tiny compounding things and you have to keep yourself accountable which people really don't do nowadays mm. what's it like keeping yourself accountable like have you, have you ever fallen off your diet and then oh my god what, yeah 
what does that look like and then how do you how do you how do you process that that's the that's that's a big one everyone fucks up the diet yeah everyone um but how do you how do you process that how do you bounce back how do you how do you move on because it's so relatable to life i think for me um two of the big things that have allowed me to be so successful is um patience so having like a realistic time frame for anything and then just being patient but also um like not judging myself not being like like i'm a very um i'm even though i'm super extrovert and it's from externally things seem quite hectic and wild inside i'm very very like chill Mm. and so if I ever do anything wrong like on my diet if I fucked up or miss a gym session it's like oh well like it's fine like face the problem and and find a solution so for me it was um being patient and just staying calm and non-judgmental at myself um and you just okay you make a mistake but then don't dwell on it don't stay there worrying about it and thinking oh god I've got to do three hours of cardio now to make up for that it's just like okay next day move on Mm -hmm. so I think that was like a massive thing for me because I see a lot of competitors that are completely neurotic and they have no patience either and they 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 explode onto like the bodybuilding scene and then like a year later you've never seen them again you know, they just can't stand the test of time within that industry um, because of, of just being neurotic about things and just not having patience. Where do you, where do you think patience comes from? Does it come from having a, an end goal? Does it, is it something you have to work on every day? How, how, how do you, because I'm not very patient. I don't know about you. Yeah, well. That. Like, how do you develop patience? Because it's all patience is a virtue. Mm. How do you do that? But then everybody wants it now, don't they? Everyone wants stuff now and... Yeah. yeah that's an interesting question which I've not really like thought about so I guess I guess a lot of it has to be uh, like not being a delusional weirdo so like <laughs> like if you if you set a realistic goal and you have people around you and go and seek advice off people that are more knowledgeable than you that 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 can give you that advice and then take that on board um it's like I, I think it was like 2007, I said by the time, I think I was about 24 then, and I said by the time I'm 30, I want to uh, have my pro card. That I knew that was a realistic goal. Um, I was passionate about what I was doing. I'd set myself like little benchmarks along the way. Um so I guess I guess it's it's easier to be patient if you have reverse engineered it. So it's like from the age of twenty four to only focus on the thirty year old goal of getting my IFBB pro card. That's probably a little bit you're going to find it hard to stay patient and stay focused. But to know that okay, um, that means uh, by this point I've got to have uh, won the worlds. By this point, I need to have won the British. By this point, I need to have grown some tissue on my quads. By this point, I need to have uh, built my squat up to 120 kg. By this point, I just need to have eaten this meal. Then you can be a little bit more patient because it's not such a drastic thing to be looking towards. Yeah, that's the sequel. Like that, yeah, yeah, breaking it down to that one meal, you know. Like, as, a, as a small step to a big goal yeah it's all about like prioritizing um <laughs> and like prioritizing today what have you got to do today to make sure you achieve what you need by next week which leads on to the six month goal and so on so yeah i think that like and again i didn't know i was doing that yeah as a you know a, a sort of process i just did it yeah do you know what so name of the name of the podcast is make it masterminds and you just said that you you know go and find people mm-hmm. that know more than you do have you always done that or, yeah. or did you go and learn from yourself a bit of both but i am a big big believer in reaching out asking for help never 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 let the ego like stop you from going and asking for help off someone um it's like even when i decided to retire from keep competing and i wanted to do more coaching the first thing I do, did was like send out about five messages to coaches um, 
that I respected and just asked, can you, I, like, I'm, I'm weird, like, I'll ask really weird questions, like, um, one, can you please send me, um, like, the book that you would recommend the most that's helped you with your coaching, two, da, da, da. so I, like, ask all these questions to just try and get a little bit of, like, an insight into people that have already done what you're trying to achieve, and just try and, like, I'm just like a sponge. I've always been like that. I just want to know more and be more and grow and grow and grow. So you can't do it on your own. And but, what have you found as well, like, the, the response have been from asking people, from us, from the podcast, we've, we've asked for a lot of help from a lot of people. And when you ask for help, people are willing to give you. Yeah, they love it. They're like, oh, my God, like, blown away that someone's, you know, spotted their greatness mm-hmm. and and thought that they could get something, you know, education or whatever it is out of that person. Like maybe now and again, you're going to get a dickhead that's like doesn't want to share, you know. Um, but in general, I think people are really. It's like I'll get people message me. I I will love to answer someone's question. Don't have to be paying me as a coach to find something out of me. And they'll message and be like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I hope you don't mind me inboxing you. It's like, fucking message me, you know, like, let's share the, the knowledge we've got and let everybody grow. So I think most people are like this. Yeah, yeah you're right. But people are scared, aren't they, to, yeah. to, to, even, to even ask. And I don't know, sometimes we always looked at guests and when we first started and I was like, who would ever want to, who would ever want to fucking come on this podcast? <laughs> yeah. And then people would say yes and be like, oh my God, they said yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's kind of like put a nice spin on humanity for us mm. in a way. And I think if more people reached out and just, you know, kind of collaborated, it made people feel a lot better about themselves. And it's like, well, what is the worst that can happen? Like you don't get a reply. So fucking what? Ask someone else. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi. Yeah, we, we we warned you that he would definitely do this. He's an absolute snake, isn't he? Can yeah, you see him? No, I can't see him. Do you know what? I'm glad they can't see him. <laughs> it's just me. Fuck him, man. <laughs> he's just he's fame hungry now. He's been on the podcast a couple of times and got a few DMs off a few local dogs. And, <laughs> <laughs> shit, it's just, he, it's it. gone to his head, man. We're talking about ego. I know. He, he needs a reality sit check. Sit down, man. dog. Or right, sit down. It's <laughs> coming straight around. So where were we? So yeah, competing, bodybuilding. So, did you get your pro card? I did, of course. (laughs) Stupid question. Yeah, I got my pro card in... um, So, I'll give a little bit of a background into my crazy days. So, when I moved to Leeds, like anyone that's watching that is from Leeds and has been in the party scene in Leeds knows that it's pretty much one of the craziest cities for partying. Mm -hmm. And... um, you know, one of the reasons why I moved here <laughs> and stayed was just that that sort of wildness. I think it was that typical story of like the little village country girl. Um, and I always felt like I was a bit different when I lived there. And then I moved to Leeds and I was like, whoa, loads of people that are just like me, a little bit weird. And <laughs> um, so I spent pretty much the entire time that I was competing, I spent in Leeds nightclubs as well. So I'd be like training really hard. It was like such a dichotomy. It was crazy. I'd be training really hard, um, eating clean, and then on a weekend go out. And it was like very drug fueled, crazy, crazy parties. Be going out for like three days and not coming home. So I was doing that throughout pretty much my entire bodybuilding career. But it got to the point in about 2013 where I felt like it was sink or swim. I could feel my uh, mental and physical health really starting to fade. I was getting like a lot of paranoia. I was like, my nostrils was like all burnt away from so much sniffing of different substances. Um, And it was just like, okay, um, what, what are you doing? And I just had this image of me at like 40, 50, just being in a house party and being one of those woulda, coulda, shoulda, all these like gifts and, you know, opportunities that I could have done and never, never fulfilled. So I had to leave the life that I had been living, leave everybody, anyone that I was in love with, anyone I was attached to, any friends, anything, and just completely cut myself off. Um, And... um, 
Uh, so like yeah like a year and a half later got my pro card because I just stopped everything stopped all the partying and I've never kind of gone back to all that life since so yeah it was just um like what 10 years 10 years or yeah about 10 years competing and just trying to get that pro card and I think it's like realistically if you want to be a fucking pro like act like one in every area of your life so it was time for me to grow up I was about 30 I think 31 something um and it was a real shift in my life where it was like growing up it was going inward it was being calm um safe secure um and it was really a time of becoming from a going from a girl to a woman as well it was like a massive shift for me um and then from the, from there on, um, got my pro card 2015, 2016 went and did my first pro show and won it, um, which is pretty unheard of as well, um, went straight to the Olympia, so 11 months after getting my pro card I was on the Olympia stage, which for anyone that knows anything about bodybuilding is like the biggest sort of stage and achievement that you could ever achieve, um, and managed to get rookie of the year as well, so best newcomer. Nice. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was kind of all happened very fast then, you know, because I just sorted my life out basically and wow. and put a hundred percent. Sometimes I felt a little bit guilty that I was able to have been so successful in bodybuilding whilst doing all the mad stuff as well, mm. um, and also I had like a binge eating problem for the whole time, so I was like not so strict on my diet because I was binge eating as well. Um, so. To have achieved what I achieved with all of the madness as well. Um, yeah, I used to feel a little bit guilty about that because I'd see some of the other female athletes and it was like, yeah, they've worked harder than me, <laughs> but they're not going to win. <laughs> they're not going to win today. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, a bit of crazy roller coaster. So, with that, do you know, with the, so with you live in the party life, how hard was it to, to cut that out and, and stop? Was it? Mm. the fear like you said of seeing yourself in the future and mm -hmm. missing those opportunities and you know to actually cut those people out that must have been I guess pretty hard to, to stop seeing those friends and doing it, it was pretty like yeah it was intense days um because I would say probably for like the last like I did the partying for about 10 years and probably the last three four years I didn't want to be doing it mm. I did not want to be doing it but I was still going back like all the time and I guess it's just that you know who you're, you're with and who you're attached to and it's um I think like f it, from being a very very small girl I always had this such a f overwhelming feeling that I was something really special and I've always felt like I'm here for something um and I've, I don't know whether that's part of losing a parent at a very young age you're kind of faced with um a lot of questions that other children don't ask like why am i here what's what's you know mortality what what is this world all about why is my dad gone where's he gone um and i think it left me with this um real desire to sort of fulfill what my father didn't get to with his life um so yeah the the question that you asked did I was I worried the fear of um getting to an old age and not living out my sort of life properly yeah that was the fear um I can't think of anything more scary than getting to an old age and just looking back and thinking well I fucked that up like that that is the thing that just drives me every single day to constantly grow to constantly be something incredible and leave some sort of positive imprint on the world you know and not just be um happy to coast ever mm. not for one day yeah do you know because if you if you when you were partying did you just feel like you were at like a, a base of i'm not really going anywhere did you find that that was like a like a source of like anxiety people say if you didn't like Tyson Fury is a good example he said when he had nothing to work towards that mm. when he was at his lowest even though he'd achieved everything mm. it's like when you were not really you were working towards something but not to your full potential and you knew that probably deep down yeah was that like a source of like a like tr like a troubling time or was it yeah. like causing like a like conflicts in your mind yeah definitely like but I think like 
when I look back at my life, I always feel like every single part had a purpose and there was a reason for it. And I don't have any regrets for anything. I'm like, yeah, I am cool as fuck. And that, you know, all these little steps towards it um, have been part of that. Um, so the partying, I feel like it, it had a really big purpose and role in my life. Um, I guess... Like again, because I've, I've I really felt like I needed to rebel a little bit and and just f- like be a bit crazy and wild and live for me, um, not in any sort of box. So partying was great for that, and also because I am such a confident extrovert kind of person, I find it hard to find other people that are on that level and that are so um, so able to express themselves as free as me. Um, and when you're out partying and everyone else is on drugs and drink they are now as wild as me Mm. when I'm in my sober state. So it was, for me, it was like great to be around people and you could be really extrovert and dancing and going crazy. I do that anyway when I'm sober. But I think that was a big part of it, just to connect with people. It was um, a real time where I learned a lot about humans, um, a lot about psychology and how um, how to get on with people how to um, connect with people from all walks of life. Because obviously I was just like a little village girl. And then all of a sudden I'm in Leeds with like so many different types of people. Um, And it's really given me a gift of being able to, like I can connect with anyone. It doesn't matter sort of where you're from or, or where you've been or anything. So I feel like that was an important part of my life and it had to play out. Probably played out for a little bit too long. I'm not gonna lie, um, but yeah, it um, definitely that like the last the last few years, I felt felt very anxious because I'd been a singer before, and I was a singer for seven years, and that was like a big dream of mine to to to, to kind of have that career, and I stopped that for the bodybuilding. So towards the end of my partying, it was like, okay, I've sacrificed a, a gift that was given to me um, to sing and perform. I've sacrificed that and, you know, got rid of that dream to do this bodybuilding. And now I am potentially going to mess up my chance to fulf- to really fulfill my potential as a bodybuilder because of this partying. Um, and that was a big thing a big thing for me that pulled me out of it because it was like okay you've messed up the singing you better sort your shit out and do this 100% and you don't stop the bodybuilding until you have done everything within your power to be the best bodybuilder that you could be so that was like a big drive for me yeah when you were making that decision did you confide in anyone did you talk to anyone did you have anyone that you could look to or did you process this by yourself I think I did a lot of that on my own you know Mm. Yeah, didn't really speak to anyone, like, didn't speak to any of my family. Um, Yeah, it was very internal, and it was very much like um, on a night, you know, when you get into bed, and it's like, you can't sleep, and there's just, like, that little tapping on the shoulder, like, don't fuck this up. (laughs) Yeah, that, like, every night, I could hear that little voice, Um, and, you know, for a long time, I'd get up in the morning, and it'd be like back to back to normal bodybuilding back to the partying and then at night time be like oh no but yeah it was it was intense yeah yeah it's it's, it's fucking crazy story man you, if i was competing against you i'd be fucking pissed off i know <laughs> you're like the floyd mayweather of, <laughs> with female bodybuilding like partying all night go train at 6 a.m and then smash it turn up in my bikini <laughs> exactly See exactly <laughs> so that year and a half when everything took that 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 steep incline of improvement mm. and focus and dedication like what did you implement to to make that switch did it just you just solely concentrated on one goal you you implemented any kind of mindfulness techniques to keep you focused like what mm. did you do to shape the your mindset to go on and, and get that pro card and get go to the olympia do you know what i think one of the because i think the mindset stuff started coming probably round about round about 215 216 but i think the biggest biggest thing actually was 
the um, the guy that I met after um, my, my ex-husband, the, the guy that I met and then was with for seven years, it was just like this um, stability. Like my life was calm. There was um, co- uh, financial support. There was um, no stress, no dramas, no arguments, no... Not that it was, like, so crazy with, with the ex. That was a great relationship, too. But it was just the my conditioning, the daily conditioning, mm. was exactly what I needed to be a professional bodybuilder. I didn't really have to worry about work so much. Um, it was literally, like, all I had to do was eat, sleep, train... And my partner Giles at the time really just paved that that way for me, and and yeah, just like allowed me to to fulfil that dream by by creating that that stability. So I'd say that's the biggest thing that allowed that to happen. Yeah. Mm. So with you know after that relationship, how did you go about finding and bringing that stability to your life after that? After the with the husband. Yeah. Um, I guess it was just, um, I just knew that I I needed something very different. Mm. Um, and like looking at rela- relationships is something I've looked at a lot like recently because I've recently just split up from the, the last guy as well. And relationships is something that I have jumped from from the age of 16. I've never been on my own. So I've had long-term relationships of like like two, three year, one ten year, and one seven year, um, and yeah. So that that's definitely been something that I've been. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But I think I just knew what I needed, and it was like going from something so fun and like a best mate, like party partner, and it was like I really need someone that's. Um, sort of like home we want to stay at home we want to so it was just and someone a bit older as well um yeah I don't know it's like you do things without I'm a lot more self-aware now so I I would know my own thought patterns and what I was really thinking whereas at the time I guess I was doing things unconsciously knowing that searching out someone that could provide you with what you needed because that's what we do do as humans it's like you know it's not in a manipulative way but it's just you know I was obviously I probably wanted you know stability so I could fulfill all these dreams so you search out the people to to surround you that can give you that so yeah yeah do you know it's a it's a it's such a good interesting thing to talk about because it's People, like relationships and stuff like that, is 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 always in the in the news and mm. I don't know on social media and stuff like that. And it's I don't know. I kind of want to ask like, what's your take on it from when you've gone from two totally different uh, relationships? Like, how important is it to find that person that's going to support you in like a certain path or a certain way? Or mm. um, well. Like, now I'm at this point, like, I'm 37 now, and because I've never been single ever, and it's like, because I can now see my patterns, that I've been with, like, incredible people that have, like, I class them as very successful relationships, Um, but I'm so aware now that it's, it's, it's important not to choose choose someone for like surface stuff because you're always going to change your your like what you enjoy what you want to do the job that you do um that's always going to change that's never going to be linear so it's like the the people that you want to connect with it has to be like on a much deeper soul level like are you aligned in it's like can you laugh together um, and have like converse- deep conversations about anything? Are you aligned like you're on the same path of gro- like growth, mm-hmm. like mindset growth or whatever it is? These things are like way more important than um, someone that's kind of into the same sport as you or someone that is um, 
going to help you financially or whatever because that can change you know that that man that could support you or, or woman or whatever that could support you they they might change their job or whatever so it has to be a much much deeper deeper level like I've actually totally weird I've actually got a list of the kind of things that I would have to have in my next relationship because I don't want to repeat my pattern I don't want to um it's almost like I feel like it's luring someone in um to fall in love because I, th I think for me, I, I must have desperately just wanted to be loved and to feel in love, um, whether that's because of growing up without a father, without having that man, mm. and then turning 16, it's like for the first time you have a connection with a man, um, and that feels special. So I think I, I, I enjoyed that feeling of being close and connected to a masculine to a man because I'd never had that mm -hmm. um, even though it's like sexual with a partner it's like you it's like confusing for you to to know what it is that you're really missing um so yeah I've totally lost my train of thought I'm gonna I was gonna ask you on that <laughs> <laughs> I know it was, it was great though yeah, on that note though how important is it to know yourself, you know, in that? So, like you said, knowing your pattern, yeah. subconscious mind, like, will do things so important. without you knowing, like... Fucking so important. Like, I analyse everything that I do, everything. Um, and things are so clear to me now, like, my pattern's, like, it's laughable. I'm like, why do I keep doing that? Stop it! <laughs> so, and it's really important to break those patterns. Um, you know, like I was saying, it, it's like... I don't want to bring someone in, a, a man into my life, make him, well, I can't make someone fall in love with me, but bring him in because I'm so desperate for that male in my life, for that love, um, convince myself that he's right for me, even though deep down in my gut, it's saying no, 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 because I, I was so in need of that that connection. It's like you've brought that, that person in and, and let them invest in you. Um, I don't want to do that again and then have to break up with someone um, because that's what I've done every time. Um, and it's like, like I say, again, it's a, it's, it was an unconscious thing. Um, I wasn't aware that I was doing that. Now I can look at myself. It's like having a bird's eye view of myself. Um, and I am just not going to do that to myself or to someone else again. So I have this list of... Um, things that um, I know a man would have to have to fulfill my everything. Like I can find a man to fulfill certain things, um, but for everything, and it's nothing like what they look like. It's nothing like how much money they've got or anything like that. It's like really deeper, deeper things. Like for me, it has to be someone that is constantly on a self-growth, a mission like they have to constantly be like that because I am and what I find is that I just outgrow people too quick because I'm I change so much all the time I'm always a, a different person every year and um, so things like that it's so important to be aware of yourself um, and watch your patterns and I just I see so many people that are um, like locked in relationships they're just not happy they're not that it, it just like I always uh, say it's um like living in sustainable mild misery mm -hmm. like you're not it, it's not like uh you 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 every day is horrific it's just like this mild misery Ugh, just like living together but not really like deeply connected not really fulfilling each other like at a soul level like, oh, no, no, can't live like that. Can't do it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, you know, that's a good point. point. How did you um, develop your sense of self-awareness? How, how, where did that come from? Did you, did, you, did you learn it? Did you read about it? Yeah. Did you consciously one day, like, on why yourself, do I do that? Was and it? Yeah. Reverse engineer it. Yeah. yeah, so I think I've always been a little bit like that. Like, you know, the way I would describe it is... Um, when you're a child 
it's like you're still in touch with kind of the magic of the world it's like children view the world in a different way to adults and then as you get older most adults kind of lose that i've always kept that little bit of magic and um sort of knowing that there's something bigger there's something greater but the real sort of self-awareness i guess a lot of the time when you struggle with um like external symptoms like taking drugs like um binge eating emotional eating they are um if you if you if you listen to them they are a tool to find out more about yourself internally so there's a reason why there's something chipping away at you and it's a it's a beautiful thing like addiction in some ways because <clears throat> it's a chance to heal something um, if you if you can if you can find the strength and the tools to 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 look into that kind of thing like even now I still um, emotional eat sometimes and again t- um, going back to the way that I stay calm I just um, use it as a tool to find out well why do I feel like why am I eating that today what's going on what can I improve <coughs> excuse me dry mouth <laughs> water but then I started. Um, when I wanted to get rid of the binge eating, uh, say where? <laughs> is that a phone on your watch? Yeah, it, it must be connected to the, the thing. To my computer. Yeah. Uh, All right. So when I wanted to get rid of the binge eating, um, I started looking into neuro linguistic programming, which is basically just um, like a way of looking at your patterns of behavior the language that you use to see if you can recreate new patterns um so i within six weeks i just went on youtube and and found all this stuff off um, tony robbins and within six weeks i'd got written got rid of a seven year binge eating well over seven year binge eating issue just like yeah see ya like so little things like that set me on my way to um learning a little bit more about what I was capable of doing and the mindset and so on getting ready for the Olympia I had to do a lot of mindset work um and then um when I finished when I decided to retire from bodybuilding that was almost like a bit of a domino effect that was like um that was like I'd been living with a curtain up over my eyes and then when I said okay I'm done the curtain was lifted and I was able to see the world in a very different way Um, because when you do something for such a long time it can become part of your identity so it's like Rosie the bodybuilder all of a sudden it gave me this opportunity to re-find out who who I really was and what I'm really here for Um, and it it wasn't to just be a bodybuilder Um, so I went on this weird journey like cut all my hair off like I did a proper Britney Spears so I used to have my hair really long all the time and my ex-partner Giles came into the bedroom and I was just like that with it all tied and chopping through with the scissors I was like it was like oh fuck (laughs) yeah and I pulled the front forward and I just looked at him and I said should I cut a fringe and he went no and I went like that and just cut into it yeah I just went off the rails I started wearing like really weird clothes and and just doing just trying to figure out like who I was so that was like a big shift that kind of like catapulted things forward very very quickly um and then um like more recently um I have started delving into the world of psychedelics and playing around with um initially started with um microdosing of LSD more for like business um and what I found with that was um, because I've always been very right sided with the brain more dominant super creative like really dreamy like can come up with great ideas but it would be very hard for me to stay focused very hard for me to um, think logically about things so the LSD was like it just kind of brought the right and left into balance for me Um, and this was when I was doing my business course with a guy called Mark Coles, who is an incredible guy. Um, and it was just like the most insane six months of my life where, again, another curtain was lifted up 
where I could understand money and business and it was like shit like it's fucking easy to make money like when you know all these different things Mm -hmm. and because of the microdosing it allowed me to put structure into my life and discipline in in different ways um and kind of like bring that creativity in and actually then move it forward it's it was almost like having um like a filing cabinet cabinet put into my head into my brain instead of just like before it was like loads of like beautiful colored pieces of paper in there it's like all of a sudden it was like in this like nice neat little filing cabinet and things made sense in a different way um i don't know if that's a very good way of explaining hey, it sounds pretty cool i want a filing cabinet in my head. <laughs> yeah it's cool man but it, it's really hard like it's these kind of things it's quite hard to um explain and articulate um and especially because, um, like, right now, my little mission is learning more language, being able to articulate myself bet- in a bet- better, <laughs> in a better way. <laughs> in a better way. Um, yeah, because, like, the, the, the bodybuilding was all just like this, um, like, crazy physical pursuit. As a kid, I, I never really felt like I had a voice and I think that's why I went so deep into like dancing and singing because that was my only way of interacting with the world and expressing myself because I didn't feel like I could use language or speak. Um, so the next phase of my life is about finding the voice. Um, and I think, you know, to do that, you've got to, find, you've got to work on your, your language skills. Um, so that you can like things like with the LSD and the psychedelics and stuff it's so hard to articulate the experience and I might never be able to do it but you know the um, the, the the size of your your the, the capacity of language that you have it's like that's the that's the the world that you have it's like if you've only got that much language skills then your world is only that size so you know the bigger i can i can create that with my with articulating myself then the the bigger my world is going to become is how i feel do you know what that's fucking blow my mind there's so much i picked one bit about 15 minutes ago i was like i really want to ask you about that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) me to like no it goes off on one (laughs) i do remember because i really did want to ask you and it was um you went back to about binge eating so i'm Mm. i'm rewinding a little bit here and he was saying that you actually looked at it kind of inquisitively, like, oh, why do I do that? Because mm. most people just get down on themselves yes. and be like, look at oh. the problem. Yeah. Again, I bought yeah. the dominoes again. Yeah. But, and then they're like, why am I so shit? I'm so shit. Like, I've got no willpower. Exactly. But um, how constructive would it be for people to just look at it from a zoomed out perspective? Like, like this, this, just detach from your actual like your ego whatever yeah. it is that makes you feel like a fucking dick mm. and just be like well why do you do it like mm-hmm. actually treat it like a little goal like something it's a interesting fucking experiment every single day of our life is an experiment like it's just testing and playing it's like it we are here in this like solid matter we are here experience the experiencing this you know this human experience but you can step out of it and play with it a little bit it doesn't you don't have to be um in it you don't have to be so in it you know and feeling the pain around things and feel it like judging yourself this is the big thing like feeling like negative feelings about yourself just because you are struggling with something you know like eat overeating or binge eating it's like with my clients i'm always working on that kind of thing with them they so often they'll message and they'll be like i'm so sorry i've messed up why am i so shit it's like no like and it's just little things like starting to write a little journal like if you are struggling with something and you keep the these repetitive repetitive limiting habits keep on playing over in your life if you don't pay close attention to them what like you just kind of you're just like a twig floating in the stream aren't you there's no there's no awareness of what's going on so massively like when I when I first started the NLP journey to get rid of the binge eating one of the things was at the end of every night writing down how I felt what did I do well what didn't I do well what could I do better how could I avoid certain situations and the massive thing for me was realizing what the triggers were for my binges 
So I realized that what, like actually just one of the triggers was if I didn't get enough sleep. Like if I was tired the next day, I'd end up binging. So like something as simple as that. Um, and then noticing that if I, like if I was sad or down or whatever, it's like, well, what's making me feel like that? What part of my life is am I not um, showing respect to? You know, is it that I am um, living in a way that's not congruent to to my sole purpose? Mm. Is it that I, um, you know, I'm doing a job that's really not what I'm supposed to be doing? Like I think so many people are living a life that's really they could they could be living a, a much fuller life, and it's. Um, it's easy to put little boxes around yourself and be like, yeah, but I can't, or, you know, cause it's like, oh, well, I've got the mortgage to think about, or da, 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 da. It's like, no, come on, come on. Like there's this, this, and again, this comes back to losing a parent as a kid. This, this fucking, this world is magical and we are absolutely blessed to, to get the chance to live this life. Yes, it's hard. Yes, there are, you know, it, it's not easy. You get these challenging days, but, like what can we do while we're here what 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 difference can we make um i know i want to make i want to make a, a a positive difference to every single person that i meet and and yeah just try and make something while i'm here yeah and yeah this is a question i really want to ask you and uh, well i'll just ask you and it'll be easier do it losing, <laughs> losing your father did it make you realize that life actually does end because people, Neil said it on the podcast loads, we're the only animal or whatever that knows we die, mm. but fucking ignores it and just float around at a five out of ten for like your mm. whole life, not really doing anything. Did it? I, don't, I guess it wouldn't have been like an, oh, you know, I want to be a fucking bodybuilder right well, now, but did it? Did that shape your mind at all in that 100%. sense? Like, oh, this shit could end. A hundred percent. Life is short. Life is short. Life is precious so precious like my dad was 28 when he died like what the fuck like i'm 37 now like to think that he didn't get to to live out what he might have wanted to do yeah like you you can die so every day every day it's like i am i am so optimistic and positive mm. i know you everybody gets the down days and all this but my energy is just so powerful and uplifted all the time um, and I, I do think well i know that that um the impact of losing my father at one year old completely molded that um and also the big thing was growing up with a mother that was mourning um she never got over the loss of my father um and there were some very dark days growing up like I my I had a beautiful upbringing an incredible mother that completely dedicated a life to me and my brother but it was like um growing up with sadness like every day really in your house um and we didn't like we didn't really talk that much about my dad either, and I think we would avoid it because he didn't want to make your mum cry. Um, and sometimes, if if she got really upset, it would it could be like two days of almost like a depression. So if you can imagine, as a little girl, like the one of the big things that I remember is my mum being in bed and she wouldn't get out of bed. She would just stay in bed with the cover over her head. Um, and I just used to get into bed with her and just lie there with her and cry. And it's like just that that sadness and, and seeing your mum just not, not be able to get past that. And I think I rebelled against that. And I, I never wanted to be um, sad mm. or, or depressed or... Or kind of let anything take control of me like that, you know. Um, so just the way I view the world is very much like I know the fucking harshness of it. I see it. I don't ignore it. I'm not like a optimist head in the clouds. I'm a realist, but I'm an optimist. Um, and there's not much that can get me down. There's not much that can kind of knock that, that can chip into that. Yeah. No. 
I was, I was, I was, I was, I was to you, man. Yeah, sorry. So with the way you were talking, the, the NLP stuff you mentioned, like I picked up a book about it. You saw it, like, yeah. I've been reading it, literally started reading it. Yeah. And it talks about the way that you actually speak to yourself. And yeah. then I noticed that you said, um, my energy is so powerful. Mm. Like how important is actually positive <laughs> self-talk, like reframing the way that you say stuff about yourself. Like I'll say, oh, I've got to go to the gym, but say like, I get to go to the gym. Yeah. Totally different sentence. <laughs> yeah. Totally different sentence. Something so yeah. fucking basic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you clearly got it down to a T more than I have, so I'll let you it <laughs> take is it away. Massive. It's massive. And again, these are like things that I've always done, but without knowing I was doing them. And it's like if you could model uh, my behaviours since being a little girl to 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 get someone out of depression or to create a happy um incredible life full of opportunities just model yourself on me like what i've what i've done without even knowing and things like self-talk like i I would never say i am ugly or i am oh (laughs) like you know (laughs) fuck that like ever (laughs) since being like a teenager i would walk in the room and i would always feel like the most beautiful and you know i'd still like that i just not but i guess the thing that's changed is when i was a teenager at I would do it in a way that would put other people down. Whereas as I've got older and more mature, it's like I use that confidence to lift other people up and let them see their potential and their beauty. Um, But I think, yeah, I I do empathise with people that do put themselves down, but it's it's frustrating to to listen to. and again, like with the, the binge eating, the self-talk came into that massively. Um, because all of a sudden, if you become very aware of the way that you do speak about certain things, I used to always say stuff like, I'm just so bad at dieting. I just can't say no to chocolate. Mm. And then when I started looking into the NLP, I completely changed all my language. Even before I'd made any um, steps forward with progress to stop the binge eating, I started saying if anyone, if I spoke to anyone about it, I would say um, I used to have a binge eating issue, but now I've stopped or, you know, just changing it. Or I would say I always I always prefer to choose a healthier option of food. So I just changed my language and that had a massive impact, massive. And I do it with all of my clients. And I can tell as soon as someone emails me where they are in their headspace, if they're apologizing for their existence sorry Rosie I hope you don't mind me emailing it's like fucking you you have a right to be here and be amazing and shine like come on (laughs) like yeah like I just want other people to feel that like what I feel where you you feel like you've got you deserve a place here on this earth to be something incredible and you know to have a life full of abundance and you know everybody deserves this everybody is something incredible I have, I have no words it's fucking true it's, it's, it's got to go out there and get it that's it and yeah exactly. and I know it's hard because everybody has like different upbringings and you know um, everybody has a different layers that have been put on them mm. over the years growing up like being put down or yeah. you know people having bad relationships where someone's really like hammered them down hammered them down but we we all have to take responsibility for ourselves and and move forward with you know like like me with my binge eating I could have just carried on with that and and not faced up to it and done a bit of work on it and that six weeks <clears throat> getting rid of it that was hard work I didn't just read a book like I had to commit to like I always say like look at whatever whatever limit in behavior or whatever pattern it is that you are doing whether it be drinking uh, drugs whatever it is it's like think how much time and thought you put into that and how many times you do it you got to double that to get out of it so when I wanted to stop the binge eating, I had to put double the amount of focus into stopping. So the the new thought patterns, the new... Like I'll tell you something funny about the way that I stopped as well. Because if you have a, a pattern of behavior, you can break state like halfway through. So one of my triggers was if I walked into the kitchen, the minute I'd be stood in front of the cupboard with the cupboard open, it was like, 
game over, like binge is on. <laughs> so I knew as soon as I got to that point with the cupboard door open, looking at the fucking peanut butter, it's like, ah, oh, shit. Like, I can't get out of this now. I'm in, I'm in. But so if I, if I knew I could break that pattern and scramble the neural pathways, so when I, when I would get to the cupboard before opening it, I would stop and do like tap out this little rhythm on my head. So that was like something new. So the brain's like, whoa, normally you just open the cupboard and eat peanut butter for the next hour. What's this? So if you can, if you can find like your patterns and then break it with something else, it scrambles it and helps you create a new pattern. And it, it's almost like a distraction for the brain where it's like a little bit confused. You know, like you, you have that scenario where... Um, like a, a, a woman's been attacked or whatever and she has that one moment where she knees him in the balls and it like shocks him and she gets a chance to run away. Mm-hmm. That was like, what this? <laughs> knees <laughs> knee yourself in the balls. <laughs> yeah, basically. Just like gave, gave myself a, a kick in the balls and it got me out of my binge eating. Yeah, but it's like little things like that. But you, it, you have to repeat it. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And then you know, over time you can get rid of those patterns. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because we started this podcast <laughs> to, where well, you go back to like people's backgrounds and we've kind of realised that no one has an, you don't, no one gets an equal start. Yeah. But you, effort is totally changeable. You can put in 100% or 1% and that's going to really determine where you get. You start, you can't help that. That's yeah. fine, fair enough. And I was going to say to you, we set up this podcast because we wanted to educate our younger selves. Like, what would be useful for us when we would be kids or teenagers by talking to people like yourself that have vast life experience in multiple areas? And I was going to say to you, what advice would you give to your younger self? And I was thinking, we'll be here for another hour. (laughs) (laughs) So I was quite conscious of time. But if you could give your younger self one more tip, this motherfucker is (laughs) the thirstiest little bastard ever. (laughs) We love him really, but yeah. If you could give yourself your younger self kind of a piece of like core advice before we wrap up, what would it be? Oh, man, just to really, really get to know yourself like deeply, deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, embrace that 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 part of you, and don't be scared to express yourself opinions and whatever it is whether you want to express yourself like physically what like just to to get out there and play and not judge yourself you we're here we're here to learn and it's like everybody should have a chance to just play with this because we we need to create these new imprints and and become better humans as a collective and we can't do that if we don't just allow each other to get out there and make a few mistakes so know yourself don't judge yourself and speak yeah that's it. <laughs> oh, that's my 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 my. my Do you know, I blow, fucking my love this episode. Oh, like, it's well, been amazing. Honestly, thank you so really, much really for good. having me. No, thank you for coming. Um, in. I want you to come in again already. Yeah, man. <laughs> for fucking sure. <laughs> I'm down. All right. I'll live in the spare room. We're just like. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows where this is. It's secret it's location. location. Yeah, yeah. So if people want to find you, they want to message you, and they can message you. Where yeah, message you me. So you can get me on Instagram. It's um oh god I changed my bloody name recently. I think it's One Rascal Tribe. I meant to check. Yeah. <laughs> Rosie Rascal Tribe, <laughs> I think. No, it's Rosie Rascal Tribe, I think. It is, you're correct. Yeah. Yeah, so Rosie Rascal Tribe on Instagram, it's Rosie Rascal Heart on Facebook, and I will always reply. Drop me a little message unless you're asking me weird shit like what size of my feet or can I crush a melon between my thighs sometimes I just block you okay yeah, yeah. you've probably got some weird messages there <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> fuck. why have you said that now I want to ask you about all these <laughs> episode 2 <laughs> 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 oh nice 